Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. It's been another up and down week for the Flames. I'm not sure what to make of this one. As always, I'm Dan, but this week I'm alongside Kevin Olenek from the Shifts and Pucks podcast, filling in for Matt this week. Kevin, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Good to be on and looking forward to chatting a very uh, interesting week heading into the All-Star break. You know what, though? What week hasn't been interesting for the Flames so far? Like, every week, it seems there's some story to talk about. There's Usually, by this time of the season, we get weeks where it's like, ah, they played some games, they won some games, no big deal. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I I don't think that, yeah, this week, it was, we. I mean, if this was an episode of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde played out by uh, a cast of players wearing Calgary Flame jerseys. It's a good way to put it. Well, let's uh, jump in. Let's talk about the Columbus game. This was Johnny Goudreau's first game back in the Dome since he left the Calgary Flames. Um, thankfully, the Flames were able to win this one 4-3. to three. Maybe not the game we wanted. It would have been nice to seal it in regulation. Um, what did you think about that penalty shot in the first period? Like, that was that was amazing fate for Flames fans. Uh, yeah, it's uh, that was a fun... I. In one hand, it was kind of a, it was a fun night to see Johnny return, and there was a lot of emotion. I mean, he had two assists. He was dancing all over the place. He had the penalty shot. Uh, the Flames have the 2 nothing lead. They blow the lead, uh, but they are able to pull this one out in overtime. Uh, and, yeah, so uh, a fun night. I thought the, fan, the fans did what I think they – I think the same with Matthew. I don't think that they treated him, him any different than Matthew Kachuk. They cheered him for the for the uh, celebrate his time with the team and boom for where he is now. Boom for where he is. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Was it was a fun night? It was probably by far and away the most the funnest night of the week, and um, been a much needed win for the Flames, but still. Um, yeah, uh, I, I also you, I felt like it was a great first for the Flames here. Like that's the kind of start you need. I feel, feel like the Flames kind of got worse as the game went on. They got worse in the second, and then they were able to level things back out in the third to to keep themselves above water. Yeah, even in I mean, we'll we'll touch on this again. I mean, both of their wins were a little uneven uh, in terms of the way like they started well, but they had that. The, a little portion where they lost the control of the game a little bit and they were able to get it back in both of them. So I think for the wins in both of the cases, I think that's a good, that was a good sign. But, um, you know, I, I, I think it's good to get the two points from Columbus and I'm glad that Columbus isn't in our conference just simply because I don't think that that's a point you want to lose to a lower down opponent, but then, well, they kind of said, hold my beer, didn't they? Well, before we get there, just a fun little note here, I guess. Uh, Walker Dewar previously set an NHL record for most goals by a player from South Dakota with one, and now he's beat his own record. Well, congratulations to Walker Dewar. Yeah, yeah. He now has two goals this season. Yeah. Um, I've really I've really liked the energy that he's brought in all of the games. I think he's brought a, a certain spark uh, to the team. And uh, we'll, I guess, we'll tease yeah, and where... Yeah, I think we all know what he is. Like, for what the role he's playing and the role he's being asked to play, I think he's he's a great addition to the team. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, no one is expecting this guy to score 20 goals in a season. Uh, he's, he's not going to be a top six forward, but is he going to give you uh, some really good bottom six role stuff? I And it's, you know, I, I can see why Daryl likes him. Um and yeah, I think he's fit in really well. I agree. Well, let's uh, let's go to the game I'd rather not talk about this week. The Calgary Flames took on the Chicago Blackhawks on Thursday. The Flames had their Blasty jerseys on, and Blasty did them no favors here in a five-one loss. The Blackhawks. What do yeah. we say about this one, Kevin? Uh, one of their worst efforts of the year. Um, we, what did the word was the word we used when they went to Columbus and pulled the same thing off? It was unprofessional. I, w- uh, I was wondering if I was watching the rapid city rush play or the Calgary flames. 
Yeah, it I um call yeah, was Colin Blackwell Connor Bedard or was that Steven Stamkos out there? What was going on? Um and I really felt but I really felt bad for Jacob Markstrom because they you know, no energy in front of him again, no offense in front of him again. And, you know, even in the third period when they're, you know, they're kind of, and I'm using air quotes here, controlling play, they're not really controlling play. Uh, I think that those are two points and we're going to have, a, at the end of the year, we're going to have a conversation about in terms of their placements, that that is going to be a huge regret. And... Um, yeah, I, one of the worst efforts of the year and, um, not just those two points, Kevin, but I think the fact that the flames seem to not be able to beat Chicago at all this year. Like, I think when we look back at points, they needed, I think we're going to say that Chicago was easy points and we got none of them. Well, last year, one of the reasons that they fit, were able to finish first was because they won these types of games. They sure. beat the Blackhawks. They beat the beat the blue. They beat these. They won these games, and came to play in these games. But this year, that's been a very different story. They've taken up their opponents very lightly. Um, Columbus, Chicago. Um, I mean, yeah, they did good on the California trip with Anaheim and San Jose. But for the most part, a lot of the lesser light teams, they haven't. They haven't played very well against them, and I think that that's part of the reason why they're we're going into the All Star break where we are in the standing. I don't disagree, and and we'll come back to. I want to get your thoughts, Matt, and I've talked about it, about what this Flames team is, and I think that goes into a lot of it. Um, my worry with this Chicago game was the fact that the Flames were back in action, you know, less than a day later, and had that back to back, and I was worried about what might happen with the the team you know, going into a back-to-back and would they perform better? And as we all know, we got a much better game against Seattle the, the next night. Uh, big Flames win there. What did you think of the Seattle game? Yeah, they got off to a much better start. They came out much prepared. Uh, the third period, they, though, they, they were starting to hang on again by a thread. And, you know, Vladar came up good. Elias Lindholm, who... I, I have to wonder, if, at the very least, if he's been 100% this year. I think there's so much going on with Elias Lindholm, but he had his one of his better games of the year. And uh, we also saw, and, you know, we started to see this in Chicago, and I think there's some Flame fans that are um, think that this has taken far too long, but we have si- finally saw Jacob Pelche with Kadri and Huberto. We saw some line juggling. And it looked a little bit better, but um, so you come in with you come you leave for the bye week All Star break with a win against a tough divisional opponent. So I think there's a lot to like about there. You get another win from Dan Vladar, um, but you there's still a ton of questions. You also leave here with a ton of questions, and I think that's something that we're going to to unpack here for the next little bit i guess well let's talk about a few of the things you just mentioned um we saw a new look let's call it second line with peltier on the left wing with cadre and huberdo a lot of people would say that's probably more where he should be playing on this team i really like that second line and yes it pushes monjapani down you know a little bit further maybe um but you know what i think I don't know. Like we've had Lucic, you know, I think Mangiapane is the guy that everyone expects to jump up. We've had Lucic on the second line and Matt and I have said, you know what? We've seen what Mangiapane gives you. You don't bring him up yet. He's good with Backlund Coleman. Lucic is above his head on that second line. It seemed like the logical choice to make, didn't it? Yeah. I just don't know. Uh, it did. I don't know why it took Daryl so long to make that decision. Well, I mean, it took him how long to get Peltier in the lineup. You got to earn Daryl's trust once you're in there. I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I I think that this is that I think for everyone, the whole handling of the Lucic Pelche situation has been. I, I mean, I guess we'll have to wait until the end of the year when we hear the true answers for that. But I think the handling of that has been beyond confusing for for everybody, and I don't know if. He was trying to Sutter was trying to make a point to Tree Living that you, we needed a, a middle six forward. 
Um, I don't know if this was that he believed that Lucic was the right guy for the fit, but it just felt like um, it just it took too long ultimately to get to get to where it is. And um, it do you think really... that coming off the All Star break, we'll see Peltier back in that line? Yes. Yeah. I mean, no doubt to me, Peltier gets sent back to the HL to play for the Wranglers for these nine days. But after that, I think he gets called up and put back on that line. Can I ask an on question? I know this isn't on the sure. agenda, but I'm going to ask this question. Um, and so we go back to the after the Tampa Bay game, Sutter's comments to Pelche about Pelche. And yes, Pelche said privately to Sutter that he played a good game. We know for a fact that Jake Bean or John Bean, pardon me, president of the Flames, was in the arena for Sutter's press conference on Monday. Um, it was a very different Daryl Sutter talking this week to the media than it has been in the past this year. I wonder if, A, he was spoken to about the way he spoke about Pelche, and B, if he was sort of told you need to play Pelche, you need to play Pelche with Cadre and Huberto. And I know that I'm, I've been one of the believers that have said that the ownership loves Sutter and Sutter can do no wrong. But I, that was that Eric Francis comment, uh, right? And the comments that were talked about after the game, I don't think the Flames management were super happy about that. And I, I wonder if Sutter got a little bit of a, at least a little bit of a lecture of how. He's been handling things, and I wonder if if Mr. Bean or someone from from above Tree Living went in there and said, "You need to straighten up," or made Tree do it, or maybe. But I, I, I mean, I, I think that I think that just from the chain of command, you don't want guys going over Tree's head. So from what I know about this organization, they probably would have had Tree do it, but who knows? Um, yeah, you could be right, and we've been talking since Christmas about. You know, maybe it's time to move on from Daryl Sutter. Maybe Daryl Sutter is, you know, his expiration date here in Calgary's past. And, you know, I mean, I said on our show previously, Kevin, I think you've got two options now. You either find a GM that's going to give Daryl a veteran-laden lineup or you find a coach that's willing to play the pieces that we have here. Yeah, I, but I, I think ultimately Daryl, I think Daryl wants to win. I agree. Um, and I think he will smarten up. And I I think we will see Jacob Pelche with Kadri and Huberto. And I think especially when you have Huberto and Pelche, uh, Huberto and that Pelche relationship seems to be uh, something that is important. Huberto has taken Pelche under his wing. Pelche has said that he's like been a, Huberto has been one of his favorite players. I think even... Even in that rancher soul of Daryl Sutter, he, that's that's got to play something in there. I think Man. you're exactly right. I think, you know, Daryl loves his vets, and Daryl gives a lot of credence to what his vets think. And I think that if Huberto and Kadri start saying, Daryl, we like playing with this kid, he's going to be on the line. He's going to be in the lineup with them. Yeah. I think that's and, why Dubé's on the top line. Yeah. And I also, I think that you look at where, and I don't think like as, as stubborn as Daryl is and as veteran laden as he wants to be, I think that he's looking at where the game is going. Um, and really, I mean, let's go back to the Chicago game just for a second. I mean, this was part effort, but this was part that just Chicago, for all of their flaws, what, I, I don't think that they skate terribly bad. I think they're a good skating team. I think there's a lot of other issues with that team, obviously. Uh, but um, I don't think that he looks at the foot speed of this team, and I, I, you, you can't look at the foot speed of this team as currently constructed and say that we can compete for a playoff spot. I mean, he kind of tried it a, before the Tampa around the Tampa before the Tampa game that they were a middle of the pack team. So he's, I think he's seeing the issues. It's taken him longer than it probably should to adjust to the issues, but he's seeing the issues at least. Yeah, I agree. Let's come back to that thought of uh, the playoff team. Let's wrap up this week first. Um, the Calgary Flames now after that have played 50 games, 24, 17, and 9 is their record, which puts them at 57 points. Tied with the Colorado Avalanche, we are now uh, third in the wildcard race, so out of a wildcard spot. 
We've got Edmonton at 60 and then LA at 62 for the third in the Pacific. So not that far out, but still out of a playoff spot. Um, Kevin, a couple interesting notes here. I don't know if you knew these or not, but at this point, Dan Vladar has tied a franchise record with a 13-game point streak. He's played three of the last four. And the Calgary Flames are now the first team to 50 games a season without a shutout. Without a, a, a shutout against, you mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. And last year, what, they had eight by this time of year? Something and like la- that, yeah. And last year, did we not have a conversation on one of our shows how many shutouts will Markstrom end up having at this time of year? Yeah. And, you know, I think, you know, that says a lot about maybe the goaltending struggles that the Flames have had. Has it been goaltending struggles? I think, I think some of it was, I mean, look, even early in the year when, you know, we had Markstrom giving up, you know, a shot in the first three, every game, I think, I think part of it's goaltending struggles. And I think because of that, the players have maybe, I don't want to say lost faith, but changed their attitude towards one of the goaltenders. Well, one is definitely getting the goal, the run support, and that's been Vladar. Uh, another game. So Vladar, that is the fourth, at least the, I want to say this fourth straight start, three or more goals. Markstrom start against Chicago, third straight start, only one goal allowed. Only they only got one. He only got one goal. I feel like the Flames are playing tighter. I definitely agree with you. They're playing tighter around Markstrom, and they're playing more engaged in front of Vladar. It feels to me like with Markstrom, they're really trying to make sure the puck doesn't get to him, as though they don't have a lot of faith that if it gets to him, it's going to get saved. Where with Vladar, I feel like they feel like, okay, the the goalie can do his job when the puck gets to him. Yeah, they're playing a bit more loose. They're playing better with the puck. They're just playing with a lot more instinct. I think that that's where I'm... That's one part of this, but you know, back to that, you know, if it wasn't for Markstrom, that game would have been nine to one for Chicago though, too. So, you know, and I, I, there's been some games that Montreal game, he took the flack for allowing that first goal early and it was a bizarre goal. Sure. But he kept them in the game for the rest of the time. That was after that was the uh, suck at hockey game, right? That was that. Yeah. So I do think you are going to need both goalies. I, at at some point, but I think I think you're going to run with I think you probably with the Rangers. I think you start with Vladar. I think you go Vladar Rangers against and Vladar De, Detroit, and um, yeah, I think you start. I think you give Vladar the majority of the stars off the off the All Star break, but I still think you're going to need Markstrom. If these guys are going to go deep in the playoffs, you kind of need Markstrom. I don't, I mean, Vladar's looking good, but I don't think he's going to take you deep. No, no, no. And I think realistically, if the Flames make the playoffs, you're going to need both. Yeah. Well, we talked a little bit about the goaltending difference. Let's just kind of sum that up with the whole team, Kevin. Like we saw this, a very different team from Chicago to Seattle, you know, less than 24 hours difference. We, it was, as you mentioned earlier, Jekyll versus Hyde um, transition. Like what, what do you think causes something like that? Why do you think the flames can have such a drastic swing? Uh, Partly because they're not taking their opponents seriously enough. Partly... Um, I don't think that the fire is in the room this year and I'm, I'm 12 hours away by car for sure to observe that, but I don't, I'm not watching a team with a lot of fire in the lineup. I'm watching a team that for the most part has been going through the motions. Um, and I think that that was another game where they just went through the motions and it's two levels of this. And this is partly you know, where they miss Matthew Kachuk is that sort of engagement. Matthew has always found a way to engage the Flames in that sense uh, and kind of use the phrase, drag the Flames into the battle. They ha- don't have anyone that's really dragging them into the battle. But the other part of that, and I don't know where I am at with uh, all of this in terms of what it fits with if this is salary cap, if this is Sutter, if this is, but there's no competition for spots on this team that like your, 
and this is because I think, like, you look back even before Pelche with Matthew Phillips and Milan Lucic, that whole situation on the Montreal-Toronto-Ottawa trip. Phillips played one game. I don't think he was super awesome, but I also don't think the team was – like, there's – I think there's a lot of players that feel incredibly comfortable with where their spot is in the lineup. Like, um, I – you know, and I think Milan Lucic probably would have been one of them. Um, I think Dylan Dubé might have been another one. I don't think Dylan Dubé has been particularly spectacular this year. Um but and I think in one sense though, as I say that, I bring in Elias Lindholm into the chat, and I don't think he's been comfortable this year. I think this has been a very difficult start for him. He lost his two line mates. He was a Selkie Trophy nominee. He was expect, expected this year to come in with Jonathan Huberdeau. That didn't happen. It's been a huge adjustment for Lindholm, and I don't think he's playing. I don't think he's been a hundred percent. If not physically, he's definitely not been a hundred percent mentally. So I think. There has been that, that's the one caveat that I would say is there's been a ton of adjustment needed on this team and probably with Kadri, Huberto, Uyghur as well. Um, I guess we have never, we don't know how that Edmonton series affected Markstrom. So there's been a sense, I guess, on one hand, as I go through this in my brain, there's a number, there hasn't been competition for spots in this lineup, but there's been a number of players that have had to do some significant adjusting to uh, either a new team or a new place in their team. And but We're 50 games in, though. I mean, at what point can we no longer blame adjustment? I think the well, first with, 20 games we could sort of blame adjustment. Well, with okay, but I've heard, you know, a lot of people have talked about this with the UFAs that go into a new team. And I've heard this from a more than one person. It's it's taken it takes more than one season to sometimes fit in to where you're going to, to a team like this, right? So for Huberto, I can understand that. Mackenzie Weger, I think he's been okay. I think it's just he's been it's kind of confusing where for him if he's playing on the left side or the right side. Um Lindholm. I, I think he's. I don't think he's hundred percent. I again. I I think it's either a physical or a mental thing. And and Markstrom, uh, goaltenders goaltending is is, as we always say, goaltending is voodoo. So I don't I don't know where what's in Markstrom's head right now, but he's certainly not hasn't been in a strong mental place this year. But I mean, we saw these guys play a great game against Seattle. So you know, like when we see a terrible game against Chicago, is that just a mental breakdown? Do you think? We know, you know they can it, do it. You know what it tells me? It tells me that there is there is a lack of leadership in that room. And I don't think that that's been okay. And I don't think that's only okay. We miss Matthew Kachuk. I think that this has been a long standing issue with this team is that they've often played down to opponents. They there's there's not. They need someone to kind of kick them in the and say, we got to get going. Yeah, I can see that. And I mean, no captain this year, no captain last year. I think they were bringing in a bunch of these veterans like Kadri and Huberto, hoping someone would emerge the leader. But like you said, it takes time to assimilate. And I think it takes time to earn that trust uh, from your teammates. Yeah. And um, because it's only a 23-man roster, there's a sense of comfort. It's like, okay, if I play crap being in Chicago, I'm still going to be in the lineup, right? You know. Yeah, but I, th I think at some point, uh, you know, every team has that for certain guys. I mean, if you know, if you're Huberto and you're not playing well, whether we have competition or not, you're not pulling them out. You know, if no. you're Kadri, you're not pulling them out. Like I think the guys that you know, Backlund, you're even not pulling them out. Like I think that yeah, there's some competition, but we have enough guys locked up that you know, even if our top guys don't play well, you're not taking them out. No, that I I see your point there, but I'm thinking of you know I'm thinking of someone like Lucic who, you know he he doesn't I don't think Lucic believes he's going to be out of the lineup. No, but yeah. I don't know that taking Lucic out of the lineup solves all that much. Like maybe it solves one position, but you know okay, so we take Lucic out, but if you know the other 
17 forwards still aren't pulling their weight, Jacob Pelty or Matthew Phillips or Connor Zari or whoever can't do it by himself. No, but I mean, the one person that put in an effort in Chicago was was Jacob Pelche. He was probably their best forward that night. Um, I think that Walker Dewar, as I said, I think he's bringing a lot. And I would argue he's bringing what Milan Lucic brings, except he doesn't throw a punch in a, in a player's face. But he does it. He's doing what I think Lucic, he's cycling the puck. He's putting the pressure on. He skates really well. I just don't think... I don't think the Flames are ultimately... I think one of the things that has to be addressed overall is the Flames are slow. Mm -hmm. Like, right now, to me. Like, even if you look at the Oilers, if you look at the Kraken, you look at the, specifically those two teams. I mean, even Winnipeg, Dallas right now, they're not a top skating team. No, but in this speed has never been something I've equated with a Daryl Sutter game. I think that, you know, he finds other ways to get around that. Yeah, but I think this is where I think, and maybe there's just a part of me that drinks as I pull up my Daryl Sutter Kool-Aid and drink it here at this point. This is where I think... What is Viking Alberta flavored Kool-Aid? Well, it's uh, this uh, right... Oh, we're on video or one on audio. It's a Gatorade here. Well, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to give them sponsorship, but that's what I'm drinking. But um, (laughs) what I I would say, though, is I think Daryl recognizes... I think Daryl has to start recognizing the fact that they're not fast enough. And the way that he's playing right now, I know he wants to play a 3-2 game, but I think in terms of he's always said he wants to check. And right now I don't think he sees his team as a fast team. No, and I don't either, but I think there's other ways to get around that and just be, you know, maybe focus on being a better back-checking team or forechecking team or both to sort of augment that speed. So I guess maybe let me ask you this question. If you were to describe the Flames in one word in terms of their identity, how they play on the ice, what would it be? Um, good question. I, and that's where I got to separate what I think they should be from what they are. Okay, what do you think there? Maybe let me re-ask the question. What do you think the team has been constructed to play like? I think the team's been constructed to be a hard-checking team. I don't think they've been constructed to be a, a fast team. And, and even Daryl said at the beginning of the year that we're gonna we don't know where scoring is gonna come from this year. So I don't think they've been assembled to be the next Chicago or t- or sorry, um, Colorado or a team like that or Chicago back in the heyday of Taves and Kane with really fast dynamic scorers i think this is a team that's designed to wear their opponent down i think they're designed to check they're designed to make it tough to play in in the flame zone yeah they just haven't really been that way this no, year and i you haven't. know it's i think and ultimately that's been that's been so the do you concern. think that's a coaching issue do you think that's a player issue do you think that's a bit of both I think we can both agree the GM has done his job. The GM has put the right players in the lineup. I think it's in part where it is a coaching issue is the length of time it is taking him to adjust to where the league is is going. Because it is a three t- where do I agree with Daryl, it's still a three two league. Mm-hmm. But the way you get to three two now isn't the way that Daryl wants to play is not with this slow kind of trotting play it's hard skating in all areas of the ice and so i think in that part that's where i criticize daryl um where i criticize i I don't know if i can fully criticize the players in some ways i you know i think there's a lot of adjustments i think that there's a lot of other things um, I mean, you had Majapani has a new contract and he has, I think he's adjusted. I think there's been a lot of adjusting, but I think this team where I would criticize this team as a player team is I think, I think that this team needs to start, pardon my French here, get up this give a meter. Like ultimately, that's where I, you know, I think that the this this Flames team needs to say, you know what, we were embarrassed by the Oilers' loss, and we need to take this seriously. And I haven't really heard like this. This there's I don't hear the passion 
of wanting to win out of this Flames dressing room. And that's where I, I would criticize the flame, the players ultimately. Yeah, I can see that. But, you know, I don't think that's new this year either. Like, we've no. seen this in past versions of the Flames team. I know where you're going with some of that, and, and I agree with it to some extent. I think, yes, you know, there's an issue maybe with the way this team is trying to be coached. But I think the big issue to me as I break this down and watch more, Kevin... I think, and you tell me if you think I'm on something. I think we are expecting more guys step up this year that haven't. I think with Johnny and uh, Matthew leaving, the team was giving Mangiapane a big contract, expecting him to step into that role. I think they, you know, maybe expect a little bit more from some other guys in the lineup. And I think that we're really seeing, you know, Dubé is a guy I think they've expected more from. And I think that we're seeing what we have now, not necessarily what we might have for potential. I think the flames are getting a good look at what they actually have in their hand. And maybe they're realizing that their hand wasn't as strong as they thought. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I think that this is an important caveat and I'm with you on here because I, let's go back to everyone talked about this defense, this, the six group of defense of Anderson, Hannafin, Uyghur, Tanev, unfortunately no Shillington. And we don't know what's going on with there. So we'll let, let's leave it there. But we have this door off. Stone, there was a belief in Connor Mackey, there was a belief in Nikita in Yusuf Valamaki, and there was this argument that this is going to be a great defense. And I was one that said, I think it's good defense, but I don't think it's an elite defense. So that's an area I think that a lot of people overrated. Um, I think the expectations around Nazem Kadri might have been a little too high. I mean, he that that was a career year last year. And ultimately, he's probably, he's not going to get to that point. Um, so I think that everybody, when we got into this year, we I think we as Flames fans just got all enamored with it's going to be the Flames and the Oilers. It's it's that's going to be. And what also happened is we didn't pay attention to what happened elsewhere, and we didn't particularly pay attention to what was happening in Seattle, where. Yeah, the goaltending was certainly a question, but people forgot that last year a Brandon Tanev, Jaden Schwartz were were out, and they brought in a, a Matty Beneers as a rookie, and you also had an Oliver Borgstrand. You made a couple of other acquisitions that made your team a little bit better. You underestimated the fact that the LA Kings took the Edmonton Oilers to the limit last year, and... You also, I guess we kind of forgot about the Vegas Golden Knights. So I think we it was in part that we overrated our own team and didn't pay attention to what was going on elsewhere. You know, and I think even if we give those two teams credits, I think that this team just, I think this team could have competed with those teams. Again, if we, if the potential came to be, like you said, there's been some issues on defense with uh, Shillington. I think that there's been a few other holes we've seen there. I think some forwards not stepping up, but I think, yeah, I just think this is a year of maybe missed missed opportunity. Yeah, and I also think I, but I think ultimately where this is Sutter's issue is there is nothing pushing. I think it's ultimately even if you don't believe that Jacob Pelche and Matthew Phillips and Raheem Zahorna are quote ready. I think where Daryl missed is the opportunity to push these veterans to go to that different level. And I, he didn't set at training camp. There wasn't competition. And you, you separated the veterans from the, from the, the non-veterans, the rookies. And I think it just set, I, I understood what, while I understood what Sutter was trying to do, I think it backfired. Yeah, I can agree with that. And I think that it, when you look at the roster too, outside of maybe the one forward spot that I think we all know the Flames have, you know, came into the league or into the season missing, I think that the the team was very much built that we knew who was going to make it. Like, you know, we, we there wasn't a lot of question of, oh, we've got this spot open. Who will get it out of camp? And like you said, I think Daryl came in with a very clear distinction of these are my NHL guys. And these are my AHL guys. Yeah, and I think that there would have been an opportunity. I think the the you know I look back and I I think that there was a, there was a there was a lot of really good arguments for ultimately 
starting Jacob Pelche uh, in the uh, Calgary Wrangler dressing room. But thinking back, what would have happened if you put um, Pelche with Kadri for the one of the first three to five games of the year? Just to see. Just to see, okay, this is what we are doing here. Um, let's look. Let's see what we have. And then we can kind of start developing and strategizing over the trade deadline. And I believe that this was where Tree was going. I think Tree is thinking, okay, let's see what Jacob Pelche could do. And maybe if Jacob Pelche could do what ultimately do the production of, say, I'll just throw this name out as a comparison just for fun, a Gustav Nyquist, we're paying Jacob Pelche less to do what's significantly Gustav, less, significantly less, and that's found money. And there was no ultimately that's Daryl's stubbornness didn't allow for found money. I mean, Vladar has found money in a lot of ways because he's been really solid, but there has been a lot of lost money in the in the change that we can't seem to find, and we haven't had a lot of found money because we lost Shillington, you lose Gabranson. And I still think that that's a significant miss. I know that there's some Flame fans that are just shut up. That's ridiculous. But I think they miss Eric Gabranson. But you didn't give Jacob Pelche that look. And, you know, and even in Adam Ruziska, he got really hot. And, I mean, I think maybe you could have used him a little more. You gave Raheem Zahorna the look in the preseason. You determined he wasn't ready. And then he's I don't Is he back with the team? Zahorna, um, he is not currently, I don't think. Oh, he's with the Wranglers, right, okay. Yeah. So, you've got that. Um, and I think the other thing is you took that loss to Edmonton early in October, and I'm going way back here, but I think this is just plain to where we are now. You juggled the lines again after that loss to Edmonton. That was a tough loss back in October, but was it the end of the world? You started to kind of develop, you, you had, like, you juggled the lines, and I, I think it took a long time for this team to recover to, to get to the points where they are. And I know that there's a lot of people pointing out that the record has been better since December, but they haven't, it hasn't really felt like they're playing better. Do you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't I feel. I do, yeah. And I think, you know, we see, when I look at it, Kevin, I see that the, the Flames either have nights where they're playing to their potential or below their potential, but I wouldn't say that they're necessarily playing, you know, better or worse. It just seems like there's nights where they're playing to what we expect them to be, or they're not. Like in a yeah. lot of ways, it seems like the same team just with the dial turned, if that makes sense. Yeah. And maybe taking Devin Chicago is, out of it. And Devin has brought this up and maybe I'll ask you this. Are the Flames having fun? I don't think so. Like last year was fun. I mean, you had Johnny in funny hats, Matthew in funny hats. And I know that Daryl wasn't super enamored with all the individual accolades, but the team had, there was a lot of fun around the team and there was a lot of witty quotes and everything was great. This year when Walker Dewar scored that goal, his first goal in the national hockey league against St. Louis, go back and watch the team. That wasn't a celebration of a kid's first game and a National Hockey League goal. Not truly. So I guess what I'm unpacking here is I, I just don't think this... I think this team is too tense. And I think youth brings a bit of a different energy in there. I think that's what Pelche brings. I think Walker Dewar does the same thing. And... Okay, so I, let's unpack the youth. So the Calgary Flames can have a 23-man roster. Keeping the salary cap in mind, you want to you want to bring a guy into the lineup. So I think we'll both agree Jacob Peltier is back after the All-Star break, and let's say he's on that second line. Yeah. Who else are you taking out then to put youth into the lineup? Well, I, I think that, well, just to promote another podcast that you had on, I think people should go back and listen to the Mike Gould podcast that you had about Milan Lucic. I, I think Milan Lucic needs to be out of the lineup. I, I think... You know, I don't think that – does he clear waivers? No, I don't think he does. Well, maybe. I don't. I mean, I think it's tough. That, that cap hit is really tough. 
which a lot of teams to take, but I don't think that Lucci should be a regular part of this lineup anymore. Um, and I honestly, with God love Brett Ritchie, but I think that's another one that I think, I wonder if that would be a benefit to the Calgary Wranglers. At For this anyone point. who's wondering about the episode, Kevin mentioned that it was episode 310 if you're looking through the archives. I you know, know. And, and I don't disagree with either name. I think Lucic, you know, and I wouldn't even send Lucic down. I think Lucic is a usable 13th forward because there's nights you want that grid in the lineup. Sure. Yes, you do. But... I don't want to get rid of him. I don't want to lose him or send him down. I could see Richie. I mean, Richie, I think it just got reactivated from the IR. So, you know, one of those positions is taken. But yeah, I could definitely see sending Richie down. I think Richie's a very expendable player. And I think a guy like Walker Dewar can easily fill that role. And I, yeah, I to me, that's, there's your forward group. It's a faster forward group. Is it an experienced forward group? No. But does it give you a little bit more energy and raw something? Yes. I don't know that's any less experienced than it was. I mean, sure, you're getting Lucic and Lewis out, but you've still got Toffoli, Kadri, Huberto, Coleman. Like, you've still got a lot of, you know, Backlund. You've still got a lot of experience on that group. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, ultimately, that's it's not as bad. You're right. Okay, so... You know, it's not like you're taking your top two, you know, NHL game guys, the guys with the most rings, and taking them out of the lineup. No. It's not like but you're you, Chicago and you're taking Kane out of that lineup. Then you lose a ton of experience. Yeah, so that that to me is where I would – that's one area that I, I think in terms of the forward group, that's what I would be doing. What about on the back end? I think you got to stick with Dennis Gilbert. Over Connor so, Mac so your six then would be right now Hannafin, Anderson, Zadorov, Uyghur, Stone, Gilbert, and Stanev's on the IR. Yeah. And then what? what about when Tanev's back? Do you so, keep Gilbert up and run him as your as your extra D man? I don't know if he can play the right side. Or do you uh, put him in and take Stone out? I don't think Stone is a regular National Hockey League defenseman, so I would ideally like to get him out, but I also don't know if Dennis Gilbert is a... Well, I think the question there, I don't think Gilbert is either. So is Stone greater than Gilbert or Gilbert greater than Stone? Uh, at least both of them are probably better than Connor. Ma I, I, no disrespect to Connor Mackey. I just don't think. Matt and I said earlier this year, we thought Connor Mackey had played his last game as a flame and I'm surprised he's still kicking around. I think he's a, I think he's an AHL guy and I think he'd be doing well if he was playing for the Wranglers. But yeah, I don't think that he's the right guy for the Calgary flames. What like in terms like they brought, um, they signed a bunch of right-handed shot guys in the off season. Like they signed Nicholas Maloche. They signed Nick DeSimone. Um, I mean, ultimately either one of those guys, like I just, I mean, I, Michael Stone is the chaos puppy. Like you just, you don't know what you're going to get for him. Your shot's going to go somewhere. It will go towards the net. We do agree. It will go towards the opponent net. Where it goes towards the opponent at, we have no idea. Could no, but at the same time, that's the forward's job, I think, to pick it up. Well, unless they have to duck because it's going towards their The thing head. with Stone, though, when was the last time you saw a bad Michael Stone game? Like, I think you can keep Stone here because you know when he's in when the was lineup. Last time you, when was the last time you saw a good Michael Stone game? But for number seven, I mean, if that's what he is, or even a six, I don't think you're expecting great games. You just don't want a guy who's going to be a liability. But you also can't be running the four out the way that you are. And I I mean, we're going to have to have a conversation about what to do with Chris Tanev. But this this question becomes a much more significant with Tanev on the IR. Um, I, I think, honestly, when Tanev comes back, you end up with uh, some combination of Hannafin Anderson, Zadorov, Uyghur, Tanev. And then it's a matter of, you know, who's playing on that last pair. And and I think maybe that's where you've got to rotate guys. I mean, like you said, we've got Maloche, who's 25. We've got D. Simone, who's 28, both right-handed defensemen. I think you give both those guys a shot. Um, I think we know where, Gil where, you know, Gilbert fits right now, but I think, I think you've got to kind of rotate those guys in and out of that last spot. 
Yeah, that's ultimately what that has to be. And I mean, I the, the Flames management knows, but I think let's can we are we I'm just not going to assume Oliver Shillington is coming back. No, I don't think so. And I'm I'm hearing from people that I know within the organization that we should get an announcement on that probably by the end of the All Star break. Because if okay. he's not, the Flames want to move him to a non-roster spot to recover some salary cap. So then the priority has to be uh, getting a defenseman. But you know what? Tree's good at that. I mean, look at oh, every yeah. every you know deadline since Tree's been here. He's bringing in the four boards and the you know those kind of guys, and he usually gives a mid-round pick. Like I think you can fill that number six, you know, or third pair right spot fairly inaffordable, in, in, fairly affordably, I should say, if you need to. Yeah, I and I think that that's yeah that is that's the easy that's the easy acquisition to make. Yeah, that's very true. That I and I and Tree is you're right. Tree has been very good at that. Um, you know, and I would be confident in knowing that. And you know, there's there are players out there that he he's able to go through the weeds and find that. So that is an easy Tree solution. I think, you know, the bigger issue there is, is, you know, the, the, let's say the missing forward spot. And I'm not convinced Jacob Peltier steps in and fills that top six forward spot. That I think this team needs, I think he'll do an okay job, but I don't know. He's the long-term solution there with the rest of this roster. So I guess the question is with the flames currently on the outside looking in, do you blow your load of assets like you did last year, bringing in, you know, yarn croak and to Foley and pretty much go all in for a playoff run, or do you kind of stand pat this year? I think you stand pat um, because, look, you may not get, you may not, Pelche may not be the answer at this point, but you don't have the assets to get into a Patrick Kane conversation. Um, you don't have the, uh, like, there's a, like, in terms of the big fish, you don't have the assets to do it, so. But even if not a big fish, I mean, I don't know that we looked at maybe Toffoli as the big fish last year, but let's look at a guy like Gustafson or, um, you know, maybe a Josh Anderson or a James Van Riemsdyk or a Duclair. Like, I think the Flames could put together the assets for one of those type of guys, but I don't know we want to give away a whole bunch of firsts and seconds again. I, I don't... I, it, uh, there's nothing that tells me, and I'm not overrating Pelche. I just there's nothing that tells me that Jacob Pelche at his salary rate can't do what these guys could. I don't disagree. And, I don't think, and I don't think whether it's Pelte or somebody else that they're going to magically save this team this year. I think you know what you give Pelte some time in the NHL, and then you look at how to you know integrate him next year right from game one. Right. Whether Peltier or Kane or Konechny or whoever you might think, I don't think any of these guys come in and save the Calgary Flames. It just reeks of desperation. I think it would just reek of desperation in this locker room where I think they've had enough change. Yeah. I And when I look at, when I look at last year and the Toffoli deal, I... I'm okay with it because it was a longer term move, but yeah. I look at the yarn croak deal as l wasted assets. I mean, they gave up a lot of, of assets for yarn croak who really didn't turn out. And I just, I don't want Brad. I, I know this team thinks they're in it, but without draft picks, we're not going to have more Peltiers. We're not going to have more, you know, um, Phillips. We're not going to have those guys. And I think this team, I mean, they thought they were in it, and they're not. I think this team has to look at the fact that, you know what, you may not be in it for the next couple of years, and you need to have the assets available in case you've got to start a rebuild or a retool or however you want to look at that. Yeah, the, the rewords that, you know, are, are uh, around. Um, yeah, to me, I, I – and the other thing is, you know, Daryl, let's let's remember this about Daryl for all of his flaws. And we've spent a good chunk of time talking about his flaws. He he won a cup from a number eight seed. If there's a guy that can bring the best out of an underdog team, and it's the it's Daryl Sutter. So, you know, I'm not saying just get in and everything will be all right. I would say that, you know. 
I would not discount them in a series. There's a, I think that they're, they match up very well against some teams at this particular point that you could get a round maybe out of maybe two. I don't know. I don't think that this is a Stanley Cup final team. That's not what I'm saying. But Do you think this know, team makes it out of round one? Depends on who they play. Um, I think that they, I think they have a shot against Vegas. I, I'm not completely sold on Vegas. If they may beat Vegas, they make it in round two. Depends on who they play. Um, you they could... can barely win four games. Like my issue right now is I don't see them putting together the wins they need to get out of a round. Right, but let me let me just rem- okay. But to be fair, we never saw that with the Oilers last year, and they got to the Western Conference Final. I'm not saying this is the same thing. But I also, what I would say is, let's see how this second half of the season develops. Because it could start to kind of change. We could see, you know, we could see this team start to take some steps in growth. Um, you know, I I mean, I don't believe that their top six as constructed is good enough to compete for a Stanley Cup. Um and I also, I guess, the other side of that argument, too, is, you know, in terms of the big fish, I just don't think they have the ultimately don't have the assets that I believe. I, I mean, I think this fan market has has overrated Dylan Dubé for years. And I've been saying for years on your show and our show, he's a third line guy. Yeah, he's a third line guy. A lot of people think that you can add him in for a prospect, uh, add him in as a prospect and and you will get that big fish. I just don't, I don't I think he's tradable, but I don't think you're getting a big fish for him. No, no. I mean, if you want to, if you need a fourth round pick, I'm sure he can get you that. Yep. Um, but so in terms of where they're constructed, no, I don't think that they're there, but I also think that there would be something for this team to go through this playoff fight and figure out who they are and figure out what they are. And maybe, you know, I mean, next year there's going to be a long conversation at the end of the year what to do with Jacob Markstrom because you do have Dustin Wolf nearby and he, you know, depending on what the Wranglers do, um, I think a lot of fans are going to start clamoring to see Dustin Wolf more next year. Um, and you've got a, you got to pay him as well. Um, so you're going to have some questions with Markstrom. Um, Chris Tanev isn't getting any younger. Um, and, you know, you got Mackenzie Weger for a long time. You should have Oliver Shillington. Hopefully we'll be back next year, but I think it's going to take some work. Let's, let's see where they are as a team. And kind of say, okay, you know, fight for that playoff spot, fight in that playoff round, and let's see where we are and go from there. Yeah, I agree with you. I think, you know what, this this year might have to be sort of the sacrificial year, if you will, to, as you were mentioning earlier, get these guys to the team, get them acclimatized to a new team, new system. I think the Flames have a lot of good pieces, don't get me wrong, but Dylan Dubé is not a first line left winger no nope. um you know i think peltier could be a top line left winger but as it sits right now we're missing you know i'd say two top line players there yeah. i think that you've almost got to just hold pat sure make a couple minor tweaks bring in a defenseman whatever you want to do but i think this might be the time to test out your young guys see what you've got see who's gonna work well next year um and you know i think if they want to make a change to this team do it in the off season. Yeah, and you have a unique opportunity in Calgary as well. And I think that this is should not go unstated here. I think a Calder Cup run for the Calgary Wranglers would do wonders for that Wranglers market. For sure. Um, I have I tossed this idea out to Sean. I mean, I th- Sean kind of poo pooed it, but you mean. For those that don't know, Sean is his co-host on the Shifts and Pucks podcast. Yeah. And, you know, you guys are in Calgary. I'm here in Vancouver. But a Calgary Wranglers playoff run politically could start a conversation about getting a new arena for the Wranglers. 
and they're not at the Saddle Dome, but you finally get that that conversation, I think, starts to ramp up because the Wranglers would be in the forefront. Yeah, I don't know if that necessarily triggers the arena discussion, but what I do think it does in a few ways, I think, A, it softens the blow. Hey, the Flames didn't make it, but we've got these great guys like Peltier and Zari and Phillips, and you want to go see them and look how great they're doing. But I think that also creates an interesting dynamic for the Calgary Flames. Do you keep Jacob Peltier in the NHL, or do you need him to go win with the Wranglers? Like, if, if the Calder Cup is a reality, you also don't want to rob Peter to pay Paul. Yeah, I know it's a it's a very fascinating question. You know, I think if the Wranglers are out, sure, call everybody up. But, I mean, Walker Dewar has more value in the AHL than I think he does for the Calgary Flames right now. Or, well, then, then the other question would be, is your trade li- deadline focusing on getting AHL type of players that help your Wrangler run? I don't know that that's a trade deadline move. I think if you want to do that, you watch the waiver wire or... Again, drop some guys down there like a Richie or something like that who you think you can clear through waivers. Like, I, I don't know you want to give up an asset to help that AHL team either. Right. So, like, as an example, Wayne Peterson tossed on waivers by the Canucks, claimed by Columbus. Do you, if you were Calgary, would you have claimed him? I think it's definitely a possibility. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to say I would have because I don't know if they're working on something where they need an extra roster spot. I don't know any of that. But, yeah, I think if you want to beef up the Wranglers, those are the kind of deals you're looking to make. I don't want to start giving up fourth and fifth round picks for one Calder Cup run. And be honestly, the guys that are available are all going to have to clear waivers. So, for all you know, you make a trade, you lose the guy in waivers. Right. That's Well, that's fair. But, I mean, I'm yeah, there, there are AHL guys that you can pick up that are not – for sure, We've, but I don't. I don't know. You're making an AHL trade at the trade deadline. No, that's okay. Fair enough. But I do think I where I agree with you is is I think it's a fair question of what to do with ultimately with Jacob Pelche. But I think for Jacob, to me, he's earned a spot to uh, get a longer look at it. I think he has for sure. But I don't know. I bring him and Doer and say Gilbert up. I think you kind of got to do it one at a time. So you're cycling the talent through. See, for me, I think ultimately the problem that I have is, is and this is, I guess, another issue I've, I, I've, I've had with what Daryl's been this year. He's talked all year about, you got to earn it, you got to earn it, you got to earn it, and then you got a couple of guys that have earned it and you didn't play them. I, I, well, I think Walker Dewar earned it. I think Jacob Pelche earned it. At least you've got, you don't have to make that decision today. Right. No. I mean, you look at the Abbots, Abbotsford's in a good spot. They should finish at least top two in their division. You've got a month to decide what to do here before the trade deadline. You mean the Calgary Wranglers, not the Abbotsford Canucks? No, Calgary. Right. I'm oh, sorry. What did I say? You said Abbotsford. Oh, I, you know what? I still sometimes think that the Abbotsford heat still exists. That's okay. We still say the Stockton heat exists. At least none of us have called them the Omaha Oxarban Knights. No, that's very fair. And I would not, yeah, I wouldn't have done that. But but the the Wranglers are still in a top two position. You yeah. don't have to make that decision today. You've got a road trip here out east. Um, fairly winnable road trip. You know, you can do pretty well on it. Let's see where you're at. Let's see where this team is at. And I guess, you know, when we say that Walker Dewar's earned it, I don't disagree with that. But I also say that for, I don't think Walker Dewar's an everyday NHLer. And he's played eight games this year. Like, at what point do you say, you know what, the kid earned eight games, he had his eight games, we send him back. And the problem is, is I don't think Milan Lucic is an everyday NHLer anymore. And I think Walker Dewar is a better skater than Milan Lucic. And I don't disagree, but again, if we're looking for for the Wranglers to be an AHL team, do you say, you know what, maybe Walker Dewar is going to take that spot next year, but he's better to stay in the AHL for now to help that team? Like, I'm not disagreeing with that, but if you if you think that the Calder Cup is something you want, you can't rob all your talent from there. I think maybe you say to Walker, you know what, Walker, you had a good eight games. We know what we've gotten you. We're going to send you back to the dressing room down the hall. We want you to do a great job next year. There's going to be a spot open. It's not yours, but there's going to be a spot open. Like, I guess I just look at it. If Walker Dewar's on the fourth line, how much impact is he going to make? How much positive impact versus Lucic or versus Richie? I can definitely see Peltier playing in the top six being here, 
But are we going to look back and say, wow, that Walker Dewar transaction moved the needle? No, it didn't. Doesn't move the needle, but it, I does it. I guess the other side of this is, what are you telling your prospects? We'll give you a shot, and they did. They gave me games. And but you, we all. I don't know what you're. I don't know. I don't know if that's you gave him a shot, and you, he has as many goals as Milan Lucic does, or does he have more? Let's let's look at Lucic here. Okay, so let's put it this way then. So if you're saying that he's better than Lucic, then what do you have to do to get Walker out of the spot? Does Walker play himself out? Does Lucic play himself into that spot? Like if we say, okay, Walker Dewar greater than Milan Lucic, it's his spot. Now what? How do we quantify then Lucic being better or Dewar being worse? Is it by goals? Because goals isn't how I I look at a fourth I think think it's, it's a whole bunch of different things. But I think it's the results of the wins and losses on the ice. I think is ultimately the best stat to tell you that. I just think to me, I think what this team, I think this team needs to have, the Flames need some competition. I think that that I think that there's some players on this lineup, even even if they're comfortable in the lineup, I think they need to be pushed. I think Andre Majapani needs to be pushed. And I, I think there's a lot of people a lot higher on Andre Pagnapani this year than I have been. I think he's been incredibly inconsistent for the most part. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's I think ultimately, you know, maybe Walker Dewar isn't your ultimate NHLer, but I think it's it's about time ultimately for me to start saying to these players, you know what, you've worked your ass off, you've earned an opportunity to push some people in the lineup, and I. And I think that competition can create some some intensity in this lineup as we go into the second half of the year. Yeah, no, I don't disagree. And I think that's a good way to look at it. But I guess that the – yeah, and, and let's just say if the Wranglers weren't doing as well as they are, I wouldn't be having this discussion. But I think if – and I think the Calgary Flames want the Wranglers to be competitive. You sometimes hear teams say, we don't care if our HL team's competitive. I think the Flames want the Wranglers to be competitive. In that case, I think you've got to look at, yes, maybe you've earned it, but would winning a Calder Cup do more for that player's development? Would getting some you know, top six playoff minutes in the A be better for that player? But it's not like you can't send Pelche down and Walker Dewar down when the playoffs are done for the Flames to contribute. No, but at the same time, if those guys aren't there, the, are the Wranglers going to slip out of contention? Their, what's their, their record is ridiculous now. Isn't it like they're, they like they're not in any position to be missing the playoffs? That's true. Yeah, no, you're right. Like if they were in a playoff fight, then I would have an agreement with you. But at this point, they're in they're in the load management. They're dominating thing. that league. They're dominating the league. So you know, it's like the least with Austin Matthews. They can take three weeks. He can take three weeks off, and nothing will change. Nothing changes yeah. here with Walker Dewar and Jacob Pelche up. I think we definitely have to keep Pelte up. I'm still not, I still don't know how we quantify Walker Dewar. Like, I think, you know, he's got eight games. He's had that chance. I, I think I, I wouldn't be opposed to keeping him here, but I also wouldn't be opposed to sending him back at this point. I think eight games, I think we know what Walker Dewar is, and we know he can fill that role right now. To me, the role of the fourth line is where, where you play him. Is but one of the big rules of the fourth line is leave your put leave your first line in a better position to attack in the offensive zone than you left than they were before. And I when I watch Walker Dewar and Trevor Lewis and that combination work, they've done that. Mm-hmm. So to me. I think that you. I think Walker deserves a longer look. I don't. I don't say he's. What about Zahorna? Yeah, I'd like a look. A little bit more of a look at him. Who do you take out of lineup to put him in? Well, Zahorna or Ruzishka. I don't know what uh, what where we're at with Ruzishka. I mean, he had a really good start. He had a really t- tough December, and I don't know if he's able to get back in. But I think he deserves a look as well. Sure. I mean, Rajishka has been playing this week. I'd say he's become an everyday NHLer. Do you take him out to get a look at somebody else? Or do you go with a line of like Rajishka, 
Zahorna and um, and Dewar. I would go with honest, a they're, line. They're not, they're not taking anyone in the top six out. They're not taking Backlund out. They're not taking Coleman out. They're not taking Mangiapane out. So you've really got Lucic, Rujicka, Lewis, and Peltier who you can take out. So I, this would be my lines for now. Lindum, Lindholm, Dubé, Toffoli, Kadri, Huberdo, Pelche, uh, Backlund, Coleman, Mangiapane. And I think I would go with a Ruzicka, Dewar, Lewis type of line. I don't think you should take Trevor Lewis out of the lineup. Like, I, I actually think Trevor Lewis, and I think there'll be a few people that disagree with me, but I think Trevor Lewis has brought in some valuable minutes. He kills penalties. I thought he looked good in the Chicago game. I, I think he he's. I, I think for what he's been asked to do, he's he has done exactly and has put in the effort that is exactly what has been needed. And I still think he's. I think even at, at the in his mid thirty range, I still think he contributes, and I don't think you take him out. So I would. That would be my my fourth line would be a Ruzicka Lewis Dewar combination. So then you have no room for Zahorna. Not yet, but I think you know. I think we can have that conversation next to year. To me, I look at Zahorna and and, um, and Walker Dewar as two guys that I think we, there's room right now for one of them. And you've got to decide which one, I guess, maybe has earned that more or you rotate them in and out. But I think right now in the makeup of this team, those guys fill the same role. Well, then you give Dewar the road trip. And then you give Zahorna when they're back and make that, again, that's that competition that we can have, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm not saying that's wrong, but I, I just think that with as few spots as we have, you got to be strategic in how you're filling them. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you're still, I still have Lucic as my 13th forward because I don't think you're able to, you're not able to move him. Um, I think he still contributes... A lot of other things I would, you know, if it was me, I would start the conversation around asking him where he's at in terms of coaching and maybe give him sort of some of that responsibility. I don't think there's a point in moving Lucci. You're going to have to pay to move that deal. And I think as a rental, we don't want to pay for somebody to take that deal. No, no. So I, I think, you know what, you're... Nobody's going to take him off waivers. Nobody has any cap space. So, you know, you're not going to – I think it's disrespectful to a veteran like that to assign him to to the Wranglers. So I think, yeah, you keep him around as a th- number 13. And you know what? I, I think he's he's going to be here whether we like it or not as a flame until the end of the year. Yep. Yeah. And, I, and like you said, I think they've – Coaching could be good, but I don't think they want to, you know, burn this guy either because I think he's a valuable guy to have around the organization. So you've got to treat him with respect for the rest of the year. Yeah. Whether that's coaching or being, you know, an assistant GM and the Wranglers or who knows. I mean, you know, Connor, I started as the special assistant to the general manager, whatever that means. Yeah. Does I mean I guess the Brett Ritchie is the other question in this conversation, and you know what I you know, I mean he has six goals this year, um and I mean but yeah I'm not sure either like I think it's I don't know you know he's got six goals I think if you want to keep him in the lineup you've got to you've got to then take like I guess the question is is Ritchie the guy you want in versus Dewar or Zahorna because they're all going to play that same bottom or Lewis. I think those four guys are going to compete for the same, let's say two spots. Well, you have Lewis killing penalties. Um, I mean, if you put Richie there, then you've got Lewis, Richie, Rajichka. If you take Lewis out or Richie out, then you put one of the, the AHL guys in, but you can't have them all. So we're okay. Right now on this road, on the next road trip, how many defensemen are you taking? Maybe let's start there. Are you taking? I think, I think you take seven. Okay, so who would be your seventh? Because Tanev is on IR. We don't know if Tanev is going to be on IR. Okay, so let's assume Tanev's on IR. So then I think it's Hannafin, Anderson, Uyghur, Zadorov, Gilbert, Stone, and they can pick either D. Simone or um, or Maloche. 
Okay. So you're sending Connor Mackey down. See, uh, that's what I would do. I don't think Mackey's going down. So then let's say that your seven is Hannafin, Anderson, Uyghur, Zadorov, Gilbert, Stone, Mackey. I think that's what they would do. Okay, so then you, you need 13 forwards. Well, no, you still have your – yeah, so you still – but at the same time, while they can carry extra guys, they're also trying to bank money every day for the deadline as well. So that's a, a balance they've got to manage as well. You know what? I think when this conversation becomes clear once we know what ultimately happens with Shillington. In some ways, I think with Shillington and with Tanev. Like if Tanev's out long term, I think there's a bigger issue there. Yes. If Tanev's back after the All-Star game and he needed nine days in a hot tub in Mexico to recover, then I think we're okay. Well, I could use nine days in a hot tub to recover. I have an injury. My something is hurt. Your something is hurt. You know what that means, though? That means you're not going to the podcast or All-Star game if you're going away for nine days. Nah. Mexico, podcast or All-Star game. There you go. Yeah, I think these are all interesting questions. And, you know, we're saying... I don't know that there's one answer to this. And I guess the, the big question as well becomes, again, do you hold patents, say we're going to try and solve the problems internally? Or is Tree focused on expending assets to get players? Because if you expend an asset to get another forward, now Peltier is out of lineup. And I, I just don't see this forward group, this trade deadline group of forwards be that in like where the flames need to be that impactful enough that you need to give up an asset. Me neither. Like and, I, or assets. Like I think it's going to take multiple assets to get the guys you'd want. Like what's like, yeah, there's, I, I just don't, I, I would get, stay away. Like to me, this is the, the, the big trade we ship. Were, the big trade if chips we were are number one or number two. I'd say, yeah, let's let's buy some assets to make sure we've got what we need, even if they're depth assets. Yeah, I just don't see the the need, and mm-hmm. I often think sometimes the 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 best trade is the one not made. Yep. Yeah, and I think you know again, if teams go shopping, and I think I mean. We can't we can't do it to Foley deal. We can't bring in money. I think we're already wondering where we're going to get money to pay the Huberto and the Uyghur extensions next year, the Lunar extension. Like I think right now this team can't bring in long term money, and I don't think with where these guys are at that short term short term you know assets are are going to help us at all. No. No. Tyler Konechny is not going to make a big enough deal. James Van Riemsdyk, Anthony Travis Konechny. Travis Konechny, sorry. Yeah, any of these guys are not going to, you know, take this team on their back and run them to Lord Stanley's Cup. And I think the big names like Kane, Taves, there's going to be a bidding war, and I don't want to bid against those other teams. No, there's no need. And when you look at what we have to give up, we have draft picks, and we've got, you know, the guys you and I were just talking about. And do we want to mortgage, you know, Peltier or Zari or... Phillips for what I think is going to be an ill-fated playoff run. Well, not only an ill-fated playoff run, but it just, I don't think it helps either of your teams. Now, at the same time, I do want to, I, if someone is willing to overpay for a Dylan Dubé, I'm there. Sure. Yeah. And, and that's, and that was going to be my next question. Do you sell? I don't think we try to sell everything we've got, but I think this team has to be open to moving some of those roster players like Dubé. Yeah. I wonder if at the end of the year, this is a little bit of a tangent um, and controversial in some ways, but I wonder if the Flames maybe should have looked at trading Manjapani after his career year last year. I don't know who's going to take him for 5.8 right now on a down year, though, Kevin. Yeah, I know. But it, it last year, yeah. though, when it, that was that's what I'm saying, right? And, but, you know, I, could, I bet they probably would have been more open to that if they didn't lose Johnny and Matthew. Because I think they were kind of looking at Manjapani as being a guy who could step into those roles. If they yeah. still had their top line, I bet they would have been more open to that idea. But you couldn't lose three of your top six forwards. No, no, that's fair. 
That's fair. But yeah, the only guy I would look at. I mean, if somebody I, wants to give me, you know, more than Monji Panny's worth, I'm willing to part with them. I if you want to give me some for Dubé, I think the Flames could use that 2.3 million elsewhere. And again, you free up a roster spot. Um, if somebody wants Lucic, you can have him, but no one's gonna want him at that price. Yeah. Yeah, I, I that's where I'm at. If I don't think you sell, but you've got to, I think, start asking around for, hey, is there anything you want that's not Lindholm to Foley, Huberto, Kadri, you know, Backlund, Coleman? Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I'm, I'm with you. I don't, yeah, not sell, not buy. You know, if there's something shrewd that you can do and you know that you're going to get the right, that, that type yeah. of defenseman, because Brad is so good at that. If you can find even a, a minor league depth forward, Brad's good at that. That's good. That's a good episode. That's yeah. a good uh, trade. And deadline. even if they could get another Kevin Rooney quality forward with the intent of, you know, putting them in the, you know, at the end of the year, putting them on the Wranglers, I'd be okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of what you I'm know, thinking. Right, right now the team has 1.6 million in cap space. That'll be just over two by the deadline. The other thing I could see the flames do if they think that there's going to hold Pat is, you know, there's going to be some teams going to take on money and have to shed 2 million. We will take your $2 million for a pick. Like the $2 million money you mean? Yeah. Like let's say somebody brings in say Patrick Kane and they've got a guy like Dubé who's worth 2.3 that they now have to move out to make that money work. I think you could see Brad maybe taking a guy like that, let's say a defenseman or a forward who someone just needs to move to make some money work and, you know, give us a draft pick for your troubles. Yeah. I, I'm yeah. Be a broker. I could see that. I could, even see. if you're not brokering, we're just absorbing the quote unquote now expendable money. Like, yeah, I guess that's kind of brokering. I was looking at a broker as being someone who's then moving that to a third party, but yeah, I could just see the flames saying, Hey, you know, we need, we need a, depth defenseman instead of us going and giving a big asset for them you got to move somebody because you just brought in too much money give us you know your guy we'll give you a seventh and you know we're helping you out because now you're you know you can shed your two million yeah yeah and yeah that i could go up to that could go up to about four and a half if shillington comes off the books i believe yeah i'm i'm with you on that but I just, I don't know. Like, I think this year, I hate to say it's sort of a sacrificial year, but I think you've just got to run with what you've got and see what it gives you. And what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And hopefully it's a chance for these guys to reevaluate in the off season of what went wrong and what do we need to do differently. And if, you know, if it is something like, um, I don't know, you know, Jacob Markstrom has been rattled. How do we deal with that in the off season? Well, the, I mean, the ultimate, the big question in the offseason for the Flames, without question, is who's the GM of the team? I don't know if that's a big question. I think our GM's done enough to earn us another spot. Me, the big question is who's the head coach? I don't know if after the season, Daryl Sutter comes back. Is it is it Brad or Daryl, though? I think it is. Wow. Okay. That uh, to me, you think they go together? The fact that there you're saying that is is concerning to me because that tells me that we have a GM and a coach not on the same page. I think that's been evident, though. I mean, the GM's calling up players that aren't getting used, right? And I think it really at this point, I think it comes down to one of two things. And I said this earlier. I think you either bring in a GM who will give Daryl the guys he wants to play, or you bring in a coach who's going to play what we have. I think yeah. the the GM's calling up the guys like Phillips, like Peltier, and saying, "Hey." You know, we're calling these guys up because they deserve it. And Daryl's the guy saying, no, they're not going in the game. So do you need to get a coach that's going to put them in? Yeah. Well, I guess this is what the second half will tell us. Will tell us where where we're all at with that. Um, to me, I, I would bring Brad Tree Living back. I think he's done enough of that job. I uh, think the GM has done his job of putting the right players on the ice in Calgary Flames jerseys. Especially after last season, I think it'd be hard to – fire him after what he did in light of the, you know, the two top guys leaving. Yeah. He would be hired quite quickly. He would be hired within a minute of his, him being fired. But I think it would be hard to justify if I'm John Bean, Hey, we got to fire this guy. Well, look at what he just did for us. Yeah. 
Well, we're running a little bit long here, so if you're okay with it, I'm going to uh, read an email from yes. one of our listeners, uh, Al. Now, you weren't here last week. We read the first part of Al's email, um, but this is what Al said. Great episode. You covered the elephant in the room well. His rant was actually sent after the game where they brought in a youngster. He, he was talking about a small guy last week. He couldn't remember who. I said it was Peltier. He and I went back and forth. We, it turned out it was actually Phillips he was referring to, uh, who pregame Sutter said he was too short. Seemed like it wasn't his call to bring him up, and he didn't like it, but chose to publicly question his ability pregame to do so because of his size. After the game, when asked how the kid was scoring, I can't remember who the rookie was, but it wasn't long ago. Fast forward a few weeks, and then there's the same crap, this time with Peltier. Matt may be right in saying he's trying to G up the players and that uh, he may be different when he's not in the newsroom, etc. My point, though, is that the newsroom is where p thousands of people are listening to the face of the franchise. And what he says there is important to the fans on a separate point. Another classic. I don't understand after the Colorado game and the presser Sutter said something like we lost to Colorado because they were the Stanley cup champions sounded odd to me as that was last year. And a lot of average teams have beaten Colorado this year. The guy seems to get away with Saint because of who he was in the past. He sounded like he's increasingly out of touch going sort of what you were talking about earlier. Um, only one thing will redeem him, and that's the results. Even then, some people have long memories. Results didn't help people like Babcock either. I used to find Sutter amusing and, refresh and refreshingly blunt. It's now getting old. He said, I also used to find Don Cherry amusing and blunt. Cheers, mate, Al. So just wanted to read that. We read a little bit from Al last week, and I think we've covered most of those points already this year or this episode and the last couple episodes. But, yeah, I, I really think, Kevin, the big – Shocker here in the offseason could be that Daryl either retires or is moved. I don't think the Flames are going to fire him. I think he'll be moved to another role. He'll be coaching consultant like he was in Anaheim or something. I think that ownership values him enough that they'll keep him around in some capacity, special assistant to the head coach. But I would not be surprised if in the end of season meetings, Brad says, why didn't you play the young guys? I don't think they're ready. We need to play the young guys. I'm not doing it. Well, then you're not coaching. Yeah, I I think I think it's it, it's it's come down to to that, and I think if they don't make the playoffs, I think Daryl has to face a lot of questions. I agree. Um, you know, and, and we're running out of we're running out of people to blame. We blame the core of this team. The core has changed. We've you know we've blamed previous coaches. The coach changed. The only guy that's still there is the GM. So maybe it is his fault. But when I look at this, I don't look at it as the GM's issue. I don't, I don't either. It's, it was, it was some very, there were some very obvious tactical errors that Daryl has made this year that I, you know, I, I, I want to be careful when we talk about inside the room in some ways, but it, it doesn't feel like this team is, is gelled. The chemistry in this team is gelled. No. But my only worry if they change coaches is do they go back to bringing in Jeff Wards and uh, Glenn Gullitson's or do they go for a Boudreaux or a Vino or another top coach? Well, if you bring it in a Boudreaux, the one thing I would say, um, I Bruce Boudreaux is, a, is a, such a great human being. But one of the one of the things that I would highly strongly suggest is you bring in an assistant coach with some strong defensive structure with him because he just doesn't have that capability. With Which him. I think the flames have, if you keep the assistant coaches and associate coach they have, I think you'd have some of that. I would assume the number one candidate is Kirk Muller. I would agree. And I think Muller would at least get the interview. You don't go from being associate coach to, you know, no coach. I think he would at least get the interview. Yeah. But at the same time, if there's an established coach like an Alan Vino or someone who wants the job, I think they've got to get a good look as well. Yeah, that's a whole that's well be a future future episode as well. But I, I, I let's let's get through the post All Star break before we fire Daryl Sutter. Are you planning to watch the All Star game? No, me neither. It's I haven't not watched my All Star thing. game in years. It, it's not my thing. It's. It, I think it's fun for all of the people. It's fun for the kids. It's fun for the sponsors. It's fun for all of those things. But it's just not my thing. I'm not even irate of who's an all-star or who's not. I don't care. 
I'm very confused by this year's all-star selection too. Like as a fan, I feel like this year we didn't have the same influence in that game to be invested in it. Yeah. We're just kind of told here are your all-stars. Yeah. That's what I, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a big thing to me. I didn't have a lot of interest in it. Um, The only thing that is really remotely interesting is when Ron McLean interviews Gary Bettman, that's kind of interesting. But other than that, not much else um, going on there in my mind. Well, Kevin, thanks for joining us this week. For those that don't know, uh, we're going to be doing a bit of a crossover episode this week. Kevin's joining me tonight on Fireside Chat. And tomorrow on Monday, I'm going to be joining him on Shifts and Pucks. So our plan is to put that into the feed next week since there are no games to be played for the Flames. We have no predictions. But we will put my appearance on Shifts and Pucks uh, this week into our feed next week so you can hear that. And I imagine some of this conversation will carry over there. Yes, and we we go live Facebook.com shifts and pucks, YouTube.com shifts and pucks, Twitch.com shifts and pucks. Uh, subscribe wherever you get your audio, as well as on the Area 51 Sports Network. So we'll have very similar conversation, but you'll get a number of different perspectives. Uh, Devin will bring his perspective. De- Sean will bring his perspective. And I think it will, will add to what we're talking about here in a lot of ways. Well, since Matt's not here, I will sign off as Matt always does. As always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.